Hey, right Riders, Keith Wheeler here. And about a month or so ago, I did a predictions video for 2021 that had to do with self-publishing. I was blown away with the response that I received about one prediction in particular. The prediction was that at least five games would be launched in 2021 based on a book. Now I received so many emails and comments saying, I'd love to expand my brand. How can I turn my book into a game? Now, since I love to think outside the box, I figured why not do a video on it? But first, if you're new around here, I'm Keith Wheeler with Keith Wheeler Books. And if you want to continue to get all the hints, tips, and tricks on how to make self-publishing easier, then be sure to subscribe to the channel and smash your little bell icon so you get alerted each and every time I put out a new video. So what I did was reach out to a buddy of mine, Allie, from the Gaming Indoors YouTube channel. And I asked him, how can I turn my book into a game? And here's what he had to say. Hey Keith, it's Ali here. Thanks for reaching out to me. I think turning a book into a board game is an awesome idea. I would love to give your uh, audience a little bit of uh, help if I can. First off, let's look at the basic principle of what you need to do. The actual process is pretty straightforward. You start with a game idea. From that, you're gonna build a prototype. Then you're gonna share that and have it play tested. That is, a group of people are gonna test your game by playing it over and over again. Each time they're gonna feed back what they think needs to be changed and what they think works really well. Each time they give you that feedback, you're gonna refine your prototype, making it better and better until you both agree you've got something that's finished, a proper game, a game that's ready to go to get published. Now, as I go through each of those steps, I'm going to relate them back to board games that actually exist so that you guys understand exactly what I mean in each case. All good board game ideas have three elements that make them up. First is theme, then you've got game mechanics, and then finally you've got player experience. I'm going to cover each one of those three in a second. Let's start with theme. Theme is the world or the uh, story your game is, is set in and is telling. Now, as an author, you guys have a head start because you've already got a rich source of a theme for your game. In fact, that's why I was so excited about converting books to games. You're way ahead of the crowd. Having a good theme is really important to engage your player in the game. Now, one quick word here is that you don't need to include the entirety of your book. Very often, very, um, very successful games actually just represent small aspects of a book in a game. It might be uh, just a, a particular war if it's a non-fictional book covering a span of a genre of, uh, of, of, of an empire, for example, or it might be one character's story. This game here is Agatha Christie's uh, Death on the Cards. There is no story per se um, relating to Agatha Christie, but the characters in the game here each represent different characters that have appeared in an Agatha Christie novel. That, the artwork and the language that you, is used really go a long way to giving you the feeling of playing something set in Christie's world. It's also a very good game. Game mechanics, on the other hand, are the engine of your game. It's what makes your game work. Very often it's where the fun of your game actually lies. Um, and that's a very important part of making a good board game. Drawing a card would be a draw mechanic. Picking up a dice, rolling it, and then moving a counter that many spaces, that's called a roll and move mechanic. These are very simple mechanics, but there are hundreds of mechanics now, and some of them are quite advanced. What's important as an author is to match your, or your readership age with the mechanic. Having a roll and move mechanic works well if your books are aimed at a very young crowd because there's very little skill involved. It's, it's luck um, when it comes to moving and, and doing things. Snap kind of mechanics, very simple. But if, you're aiming, uh, if your book's aimed uh, uh, for an older audience, like teenagers or adults even, well, then you need to be thinking of more complex mechanics. Now, as someone who's never created a board game, you might be stuck as to where to go. Well, the good thing is you can draw inspiration from other existing games. Now, I'm not saying copy them wholesale, but I am saying absolutely leverage what you can from existing games. And there's a plethora of different kinds of games out there. One good example that I'm going to bring up here is this. This is Lord of the Rings, The, Confront the Confrontation. And it's 
designed by a guy called Renier Knizia. I've probably ruined his name there. He's a German guy, but he's very famous in the industry. Uh, he was a hedge fund manager that turned into a board game designer, a very successful board game designer, and he makes incredibly uh, deep, complex, strategic games, uh, very much aimed at adults. Now, this game here takes the story of Lord of the Rings and the characters in Lord of the Rings uh, and brings them to life. But at its heart, this game is actually the game of Strategio. You're actually two factions against each other, the Fellowship and the, um, and the Sauron's forces. What's really good here, harking back to theme, is that the individual pieces that go to make up uh, your fellowship, for example, have powers that you can then bring to life. The Nazgul, for example, the ring race, travel on horses, and therefore their ability is to travel all over the board. Anyway, the point is, very famous designer, very famous licensed book, but using a very old and known game mechanic of Strategio underlying uh, its, its, its running game mechanics. Right, so yeah, top tip on that then is to go out, play lots of games, because uh, if you play lots of games, you'll learn these different mechanics and you'll find a game that you can then utilize for inspiration and perhaps bring into your world. Put your theme on an existing game. That's what I'm saying there. Let's go on to player experience, the third part of what makes up a good board game idea. Do you want your game to be a deep, silent, thinking kind of game like chess, uh, for example? Or do you want it to be quite a light, fun-hearted kind of activity that you can play with a whole family on a Saturday afternoon? Uh, something like uh, the Game of Life, for example. Or do you want it to be a party game, almost with minimal sort of cards, something almost like charades or charades? I can never remember how that's pronounced. Um, maybe something like that. Well, again, there's a genre of game that will fit. Think clearly about what kind of experience you want your players to have and map it back to the story you're trying to tell in your book. Now, player experience isn't just what you want your players to feel. It's actually the kinds of conversation that take place during the game. It's the kind of interactions that happen. A game like Shoots and Ladders, the game is competitive. Everyone's competing against each other. Nowadays, you can have cooperative games, which you may not be aware of, where everyone teams up and is actually against the board itself, the game itself. Uh, those are called co-op games. You can get games where everyone's playing, but there's one guy who may be a traitor and is actually working against the rest of you. Traitor games are very popular uh, uh, of late. And again, it might suit your story very well, especially if you've got characters where one one of them's under suspicion, perhaps. Right, we're going to move on. You've got your game idea all sorted out. You think you know what you want. The next thing you need to do as quickly as possible is to create a prototype. Now, a prototype is the thing you're going to take and share with other people for them to test. Initially, it's gonna be pretty rough and ready. It's gonna be cardboard, uh, bits of Lego, um, pieces from an existing board game. All of these things are very valuable and usable when you're making your prototype. Don't worry about artwork at this stage. What you wanna do is just test and prove that the game itself is fun and that it works. Now, we live in a very uh, locked down kind of uh, situation at the moment. So if you can't build a, a physical uh, item to test, a physical prototype, don't worry, because there are digital ways of doing it. Services like Tabletop uh, uh, Simulator and Tableopia, and I'll send some links across, um, they're great for creating um, prototypes on your computer that you can then immediately share and have other people play. Talking of which, let's move on to playtesting. Playtesting is the heart of the whole process of game design and making uh, a board game. Playtesting is the thing that's going to take the longest. What you want to do is find a group of people that represent your final audience. Um, in fact, to begin with, you just want to find anyone. Find anyone to play your game and get them to play it without interaction from you if possible. You want them to, to, to go through the process of playing your game and come back and tell you exactly what they thought was fun, what was exciting, what didn't quite work and what they found confusing or frustrating. Let them ask you questions and make suggestions. You don't have to take any of it on board. 
but it's usually advisable. Remember, you are still the designer. All the way through the playtest, you want to make sure that you want to keep things as simple as possible and as fun as possible. And of course, most importantly, as true to your book as possible. After a period of time, you're going to get to a stage where both you and your playtesters agree the game is as as a good a game as it's going to get. At this stage, you want to start locking down the rules by basically writing them out. Again, don't worry too much about artwork at this stage. When you've got a game that both parties agree is good, that is your playtesters and you agree is a good game, well, then you're ready to publish. The world of publishing for board games is very similar for the world, uh, to the world of publishing for books. You have two basic choices, either self-publish or go down to a publisher. Now, going through a publisher uh, means that they'll look after the artwork, but it also means you're going to have to give up some creative control. They're very likely going to want to tweak your game because, uh, and change some of the mechanics because they know what sells. But they also look after the manufacturing and the fulfillment and all the other bits, which is kind of good. Now, Conversely, you can go to self-publishing, of course. Here, there are basically three different ways of doing this. If you want to really pump money in and, and uh, have some support when you do this, you could try a Kickstarter campaign. This is quite an involved process and it's not as easy as it sounds. You need to have a lot of publicity uh, and you need to be very dedicated into making it successful. But some of the biggest projects on Kickstarter have been tabletop games. Uh, Exploding Kittens, for example, which I can say thankfully wasn't based on a book, um, did raise something like $8 million uh, when it was trying to get published. If you went down the route of making a digital product for your prototyping uh, because you were using Tabletopia, for example, uh, well, the good news is that actually going live and making your game available to a greater audience is as easy as just pressing a button more or less, because that platform allows you to publish your game when you think it's ready immediately. The third way of self-publishing that I would advocate is actually creating something called a print and play. That's where you've got the components and the artwork all done now, uh, and you're making them available probably through your own uh, storefront on a Shopify or your website. There people will download, print out the components and play your game. Very often that's done on a low end, but it does mean you can reach a lot of people very quickly. Well, folks, that was a quick overview of how you take your book to a game, uh, the different steps involved and some of the considerations you need to make. There is a lot more detail to be said. And if you are interested in doing it, then perhaps visit me at Gaming Indoors, where I go into a lot more detail about each of those steps. For now, though, I'm going to hand you back over to Keith. Cheers. Thanks, Ali. Now, obviously, we can dive down a huge rabbit hole on this topic, but Ali and I wanted to make sure that we at least gave you a strong place to start. Now, if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and head on over to Allie's channel, Gaming Indoors, and give it a little love. Now, if you really want to expand your brand, have you thought about creating puzzle books as companion books for your already existing catalog? Check out this playlist right here that I did where I show you how to get started with puzzle books. Or you can check out this video that YouTube dares you to watch. I'll catch you in either video and remember to write right.